Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joseph Gildenhorn, Chairman of the Woodrow Wilson Center's Board of Trustees, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's Director's Forum with our distinguished guests, General David Petraeus, Commander of the United States Central Command. Established by an act of Congress in 1968, the Wilson Center is our nation's official living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. It was founded to honor and build upon his legacy as a man who bridged the divide between scholarship and public policy. Here at the Center, our mission is to bring together the thinkers and the doers, and these include policymakers, scholars, business leaders, and in the hope and belief that a frank and open dialogue will lead to better understanding, cooperation, and positive public policy. Our guest speaker, General David Petraeus, happens to be a graduate of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. But his connection with President Wilson and this center, its mission runs far deeper. General Petraeus is one of this generation's finest representations of the Wilsonian ideal, which is bringing the divide that too often separates the scholar and the public servant, because it is clear that General Petraeus is both. As Defense Secretary Robert Gates observed and recently noted, and I quote, General Petraeus is, a, is the preeminent soldier, scholar, and statesman of his generation. Our guest speaker today is a thinker and a doer, and an educator in the grandest sense of the nation owes him an enormous debt of gratitude. As CENTCOM commander, General Petraeus oversees the activities of 215,000 military personnel serving in four and a half million square mile, in this four, four and a half million square mile area, stretching through the Arabian Gulf region into Central Asia. And as we all know, his command includes responsibility for the ongoing wars in, that er in Iraq and Afghanistan. His service in Iraq began with his command of the 101st Airborne Division, during which he led the Screaming Eagles in combat about the first year of Iraqi freedom. According to an Army War College study, General Petraeus and his troops moved quickly into the political vacuum and worked vigorously to restore economic activity and generate a functioning Iraqi administration. During his second deployment in Iraq, General Petraeus implemented a successful counterinsurgency strategy which resulted in a dramatic decrease in violence and which promoted enhanced stability in Iraq. He is one of the chief architects behind the concept of, achie of achieving our military goals in Iraq and elsewhere by winning the hearts and minds of its citizens. And there is no doubt that General Petraeus' scholarship contributed greatly to the successful counterinsurgency operations in Iraq and which is now deployed in Afghanistan and other areas of conflict. Born in Cornwall and Hudson, New York, General Petraeus was commissioned in the infantry upon graduation from the U.S. Military Academy in 1974, and where he graduated in the top 5% of his class. He has held leadership positions in airborne, mechanized, and air assault infantry units, both in Europe and in the United States. He has previously commanded a battalion in the 101st Airborne Division and a brigade in the 82nd Airborne Division. In addition, he has held a number of staff assignments, including aid to the Chief of Staff of the Army military assistant to the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, Chief of Operations of the United Nations Forces in Haiti, and Executive Assistant to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. General Petraeus' awards and decorations are too numerous to mention here, but a few in particular stand out. He has received the Defense Distinguished Service Medal, the Bronze Star Medal for Valor, and the Gold Award of the Iraqi Order of the Day Palm. He also received the Woodrow Wilson Center Award for Public Service just last year in Tampa. Uh, and Foreign Policy Magazine re recently ranked him as one of the world's top 100 public intellectuals. He and his wife, Holly, have two children. I'd like to remind everyone here that uh, <coughs> General Petraeus' comments are off the record. And following his prepared remarks, he has agreed to take questions. And we ask at the conclusion of his remarks uh, that you remain seated until he leaves the, uh, the room. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor and privilege to introduce to you General David H. Petraeus. Please come. Thank so, thanks very much. I think I'll start out over here. And I'll, 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 I'll
think I'll start out over here. Um, and if I could, I probably should correct one of the last things that you said, but it'll be difficult to be off the record with uh, <laughs> seven cameras in the back of the room. So I guess I will concede that well, this I is probably on the record, on and, the record. Uh, and go to it through that. But I, I thank you very much for your, uh, for your kind introduction, Ambassador. It's great to see you again. And uh, more importantly, uh, thanks for your great service to our country, country as a diplomat, uh, as a corporate leader here in Washington, and of course, uh, your leadership here of the Woodrow Wilson Center. Your generous words, though, bring to mind an admonition uh, from Mark Twain. Uh, it goes something like this. Uh, Try to do the right thing. It will please some and amaze the rest. <laughs> uh, and thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, it's, it's great to see this wonderful turnout. I guess there's a few uh, more in breakout rooms somewhere. It's one of those occasions where you say it looks like we've got everybody here except for the fire marshal, and it's just as well that he's not here, I guess. Um, I did just get back at uh, 3 o'clock this morning uh, with Ambassador Holbrook from a trip to Afghanistan uh, where we hosted a civil military review of concept drill. This is not just U.S. civil and military. It was also all coalition. Uh, civilian and military leaders, and uh, our Afghan partners uh, with very strong representation from the different ministries. And we subsequently had a uh, two-hour meeting with President Karzai before getting on the plane last night, Kabul time, uh, to get back here at about 3 o'clock this morning. I say that uh, just up front in case my usual swift flash to bang time is a bit delayed here <laughs> this afternoon. Um, Congressman Hamilton, thanks very much uh, for the invitation to be here. Thanks for your I think 30 plus years of uh, service in a hill not too far from here and uh, your service subsequently in a host of different uh, endeavors including uh, leadership here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, and thanks to all of you again for joining us. This is indeed the second attempt that we tried to schedule <coughs> this. Uh, the first one was delayed by what's been called Snowmageddon, I understand here uh, in Washington. But it is great to be with this organization again. Uh, we did have a wonderful event down there in Tampa and St. Petersburg. Uh, late last year. Now, what we want to do today is have what's called a conversation. And so I'll transition over there to a seat where we can have a, a conversation. And these are enjoyable, frankly, because they go where uh, the moderator and then the, those in the audience uh, want it to go. Uh, as always, um, you know, you've heard the deal that it's every general officer's First Amendment right to use PowerPoint slides and exercising his freedom of expression. And so I do indeed have a deck of slides here, and then also the other tool in expressing our freedom of expression, that is a PowerPoint, or a, 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 a laser pointer. And so with that, uh, I'll be happy to go over here. You can have the first question, I think, Ambassador. Thank you, General. Um, it's good to see this is my seat. <laughs> <laughs> <Good scene. laughs> I'll take it anyway. <laughs> well, let me start, uh, take the privilege of the first question. And the question is, how does the deadlocked Arab-Israeli uh, uh, Israeli peace process uh, affect the U.S.'s ability to advance its interests in the CENTCOM area of conflict? Well, let me, let me thanks for asking that, actually, because it's something I've been trying to clarify to uh, get the proper characterization. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I think there have been some incorrect reports, frankly. And then there have certainly been mischaracterizations of what was in the posture statement that we submitted, that I submitted uh, to Congress as part of the normal spring testimony that takes place by uh, geographic combatant commanders. Um, first of all, the inaccuracies. Uh, and all of this hit in the blogosphere right about when uh, the Vice President was, was visiting Israel or shortly thereafter. And so it all tended to snowball a bit, I think. And, get aggregated in a way that probably was not quite right. Uh, but it said in, in one of these blog reports that got it all started that I had requested uh, the addition of Israel and the Palestinian territories to the Central Command Area of Responsibility. It's just not correct. Uh, we do submit every year or uh, about every year a unified command plan recommendation as a geographic combatant commander. Um, as I think every time the CENTCOM staff and commander have considered that particular document going in, there was a discussion about whether we should add uh, Israel and the Palestinian territories. As you know, they're part of the uh, European command. Uh, in fact, why don't I just show the CENTCOM area of responsibility? You mentioned 
But if you can put up, uh, I'm one of six geographic combatant commanders. We are the, the so-called warfighting commanders are shown right here. Uh, the world is divided up into six areas of responsibility. And you can see the central command area right here. It's 20 countries basically from Egypt to Pakistan, from Kazakhstan down to Yemen. And of course, we included the waters off Somalia so we could keep Johnny Depp and the pirates there as well in our area. <laughs> Um, but if you can blow it up, if you can go to our uh, particular area, uh, we have another slide that blows this up a bit. I can show that, in fact, uh, Israel and, of course, Palestinian territories are carved out of that. It's a little bit hard to see, but there, there is our boundary uh, right here. Um, and it also just see this is basically what keeps us. We, we, you know, people occasionally say, hey, what does a central command commander do? And, you know, what do you do for a living? And I say, well, you think of the guy in the circus that runs around and he puts a plate on a stick and gets it spinning and then he goes to another stick and he puts that plate. And so we say we try to keep a lot of plates spinning. And these are basically the various missions, if you will, the plates indeed that we're trying to keep uh, up on that stick and revolving ideally at a more rapid rate uh, of speed. Now, uh, in fact, in the uh, posture statement uh, that I submitted, uh, and again, as I said, it, we did not ask for that addition in the formal response of our UCP. It was discussed as it has been uh, every time I think the uh, CENTCOM commander and staff have approached this. And you also look at other countries around the periphery just to ask, you know, should there be others that we might want to uh, add to our area for some reason or other. Uh, the other was that I'd sent something to the White House saying we've got to do this or that, and that I, commanders don't send stuff directly to the White House generally. Every now and then, the President has occasionally asked, during the Afghan process in particular, he asked uh, once or twice for something directly from me, and I gave it to him directly, obvi obviously with info copies to the, those in the chain of command, the Secretary of Defense, and then also uh, to uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Um, now, what we did do is in the posture statement, uh, again, this 56-page document, not in my opening statement. In fact, I never really said this to Senate, uh, but it was in the formal submission. We listed a number of factors that shape the strategic context within which Central Command uh, uh, operates in our area of responsibility. I think there were 11 different factors. And I actually thought this question might come up. <laughs> and so I have those factors here for you. Militant Islamist movements, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, ungoverned, poorly governed, and alternatively governed spaces, insufficient progress toward a comprehensive Mideast peace process, I'll come to that, or Mideast peace, significant sources of terrorist financing and facilitation, piracy, ethnic, tribal, and sectarian rivalries, criminal activities such as weapons, narcotics, and human trafficking, uneven economic development, lack of employment opportunities, and lack of regional and global economic integration. Now, what folks I think rightly seized on was the inclusion of the comment about insignificant progress or insufficient progress toward a comprehensive Mideast peace process and the description that was then in that, which included uh, uh, reference to a perception of uh, U.S. bias toward Israel and so forth. It did not say anything about settlements, didn't say anything about uh, uh, putting our soldiers at risk or something like that. But it does create an environment. It does contribute, if you will, to the overall environment within which uh, we operate. Now, I think it is fair to say, though, uh, and I subsequently in the speech up in uh, New Hampshire um, noted that, you know, I firmly agreed with what Secretary Clinton's speech uh, shortly uh, after that time stated. And I think it's fair to say you could have said, General, nonetheless, Israel is, has been, is, and will be a an important strategic ally of the United States. And that is fair enough. And I think that that's something that we uh, could and should have included in that just to make sure that there was no misperception about what we were implying by this. But again, the fact is that I did indeed offer during the transition to the new administration uh, our view that the lack of progress toward MIDI, a comprehensive Mideast peace is indeed something that does very much shape the environment. I mean, if you talk to the moderate leaders in the region, uh, typically, although Iran, I think, is now edging that issue out, 
but typically they will state that their biggest concern is indeed the ramifications from not seeing progress toward that because what it does is it gives the, the radicals, uh, the extremists, uh, an argument that the only time that they've made progress uh, on that issue is when there has been, say, an intifada or some violent uh, response. And that's what we are trying to get at with that. And again, I thank you for that opportunity to provide that amplification. I, all I can say is we have a lot of plates spinning around <laughs> at all, all times. Uh, I'm going to take ask the next question, then I'll open it up to the audience. Uh, does the planned withdrawal of U.S. forces uh, from Iraq remain on schedule, uh, despite the spike in terrorist attacks both before and after the election, recent election? It, it does, is the short answer. Uh, the fact is that um, We've really we've been working at this for some time, as you know. You, you know, when you draw down from the substantial number of forces and substantial number of bases and, and items of equipment that we had, this is something that's been ongoing for quite some time. Uh, indeed, the first big step was probably moving out of the cities uh, back last summer, uh, and we have subsequently been on a on a, on a uh, track that includes transitioning bases and moving again, tens of thousands of items of equipment uh, out of Iraq, either back to the United States or, in some cases, on to Afghanistan. We're at about 96,000 uh, troopers on the ground in Iraq right now, uh, and we are on track to be down to 50,000 by the end of August. Of equal importance is not just that reduction of forces. <coughs> uh, it is also that we will go, uh, have a mission change at the end of August as well, and that mission will uh, include uh, explicitly being advise and assist forces uh, for our Iraqi partners not conducting unilateral combat operations on our own. Now, the truth is we've been moving to that for quite some time as well. In fact, no operations are conducted at this point uh, without uh, arrest warrants being attached to them. We have really tried to support the rule of law except in a case where there is an imminent threat and you always, obviously, you never uh, remove the right to protect yourself. And so in that case, there still is uh, the opportunity to take action unilaterally as required, and that is part of the strategic agreement that was reached with Iraq uh, in late 2008. Now, I probably, why don't I put this in context as well? Because the level of violence actually, uh, you know, you, there's no question. There were horrific attacks last week in Baghdad. But by and large, the level of violence remains very substantially uh, down from, say, the peak. Let me just explain this slide. This is January 2004 right here. This is last Friday night uh, in Iraq. Each one of these lines represents a week's worth of actual attacks and then attempted attacks. In other words, imp improvised explosive devices that were found and cleared rather than exploded. Now, let me just tell you that what this equates to at the height of the uh, violence, say in the spring of 2007, when we launched the surge of forces uh, into Iraq, by the way, the big surge was the surge of ideas that enabled the employment of these forces in a manner that was different uh, uh, from what we've been doing before. But that surge of forces enabled us to employ the uh, counterinsur comprehensive counterinsurgency approach in a way that we'd not been able to do before. But as you go on the offensive, the enemy fights back. So in any event, we had over 220 attacks, actual attacks per day in Iraq at this time right here. And typically now the average on a day is somewhere around 15 or so attacks. It's been a bit less than that. You can see a period in here uh, been a bit more than that at times. There was a spike for the election as al-Qaeda did all that it could do to keep the Iraqi people from going to the polls, and they did not succeed. Over 60% of the eligible Iraqi voters uh, actually did cast a ballot, and for what it's worth, over 85 percent of those, according to a, a poll that we put a lot of stock in, uh, said that they felt they were able to do that without any kind of intimidation or influence. So again, quite a credit to the Iraqi people and to the Iraqi security forces because they had the lead. But even, again, with the, the sensational attacks that we saw last week, which were indeed horrific, uh, the level of violence has remained generally at a relatively low level uh, for Iraq and at a level that does not uh, prevent uh, the continued construction and reconstruction that has taken place ever since the level of violence was reduced to a point uh, that that was, uh, was made possible 
in the wake of the surge. So I think that gives you a sense of where we are. Now, is there political drama in Iraq right now? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and again, we've occasionally talked about this as being Iraqracy, not democracy, and it is. Um, but, you know, actually a test question for you. 20 countries, you saw the area of responsibility, touch wood, um, but is this perhaps the most democratic country in the 20 countries of the Central Command Area of Responsibility? And, you know, it's an arguable proposition. Certainly there are other countries where votes are cast, uh, but I think, um, again, if they can come out of this with a representative government, in other words, one that represents all elements of the Iraqi population and is therefore reasonably responsive to all elements of the population, you will have the benefits of what we know as democratic governance and that we have seen, in fact, as uh, during the run-up to the election. Uh, a big reason that various Iraqi leaders put attention to certain key concerns of the population was the fact that they knew they were going to face the electorate uh, at the polls. And I know that Congressman Harmon and others would, uh, so would know exactly what that is all about. And it's great to see you here as well. Thank you, Jim. Uh, let me op open it up to the audience now. Uh, Sam? Please state your name and affiliation. Yeah, and who is that guy? <laughs> <laughs> who is Donald this guy Casey. down in the front row here? How did he get here? Pull. <laughs> <laughs> uh, General, we're in Afghanistan for a limited time, whatever that time may be. Is it your view that when we leave, there must be, in order to serve our security interests, some sort of functioning government, central, I suppose, that has enough support of the people, enough efficiency, enough will, all of those things, in order to continue that security for themselves and us? Or is there some other way uh, working with regional power centers and our own ground forces that uh, are engaged right now? I guess I'm asking whether at the end of the day, uh, when people say Hamid Karzai is a corrupt mess, the answer would be it really doesn't matter. Well, first of all, I think what you have characterized is, is in a general sense of you know how do you get to where we want to want to be uh, when ultimately we begin that, begin that process of drawdown and so forth. Uh, I think that's generally right. In other words, uh, to achieve our vital national security interest, uh, as the president has announced well, it, of, of ensuring that this does not once again become a sanctuary or safe haven for Al Qaeda or other transnational extremists, because there are a couple of affiliates there that also carry out transnational extremist activities. Uh, to do that, uh, as was articulated in the president's policy, you've got to have a certain amount of central governance that certainly can employ traditional uh, local forms of governance, traditional social structures, tr traditional dispute resolution, but there obviously has to be enough control that, again, there cannot be, be sanctuaries or safe havens for al-Qaeda. Um, and we believe that the, uh, the approach uh, that is being taken and which we've embarked is, is the right way to try to get to that. Are there challenges to that? Uh, without question. And again, as I mentioned, we just came from a very comprehensive uh, review of concept drill there uh, in Iraq. As I said, Ambassador Holbrook and I uh, co-chaired with all of the leadership of ISAF and the international community, uh, the Afghan government, uh, and so forth, uh, and then uh, culminated with us essentially back briefing uh, President Karzai, who also joined us on day one of that uh, review of concept drill. And then after, at the end of day two, we went and, uh, and saw him and had a, uh, a very, uh, very good, very productive uh, and constructive two-hour meeting with him that covered the, the waterfront in terms of what's coming up for Afghanistan with the peace jerga, the Kabul conference uh, elections, President Karzai's visit to the United States and all the rest of that. I might want to put Afghanistan in context for you, if I could, too, and just sort of tell you what we've tried to do over the course of the last year uh, before we go on to the next question. If you can maybe use the, uh, we sometimes use a puzzle slide, and because it is uh, sometimes, that, that's probably appropriate. What we've tried to do over the course of the last year is this right here, to get the inputs right, to get the components in place for the conduct of a comprehensive civil military campaign plan. Those included these four elements right here. We started by looking at the organizational structure, and I can tell you that having done this for a living in Iraq, 
uh, a comprehensive civil military counterinsurgency campaign. I looked at the organizational structures and recognized that there were some that were missing, frankly, uh, or that were certainly not resourced adequately. There was not, for example, what is now called the Joint Command. That's a three-star level operational command. Commander wasn't dual-hatted as the U.S. Forces Commander. Believe it or not, there were forces that reported directly to me from within Afghanistan bypassing the NATO commander who was a U.S. Army Force Star General. And again, a host of these other elements right here. All of these are essential to the conduct of what it is we're trying to do, but frankly, we did not have those within that 30,000 strong structure uh, that uh, was in place in early January 2009. Uh, then obviously you want to get the, the best folks you can in, in charge of those organizations and during the course of rotations and everything else and then standing up new units uh, we sought to do that. Uh, by the way, Stephen de Mistura, some of you will recall, was the s special representative of the Secretary General in Baghdad. Uh, it's not entirely coincidental that his great job there resulted in him, his reward is he gets to go to Kabul, and I had a great <laughs> chat, great chat with him while I was there uh, over the weekend. He also participated in this review of concept drill with us. By the way, the NATO senior civilian representative, an ex extremely talented UK uh, diplomat, uh, has partnered very, very effectively with General McChrystal in the ISAF, again, side of things and done a great job there as well. Um, then you have to get the big ideas right. Uh, so again, get the campaign plan, tweak that, get reintegration guidance. You know, again, you don't kill or capture your way out of an industrial strength insurgency. You have to take as many of them out of, off the, the field by trying to convince them to be part of the solution instead of a continuing part of the problem by some form of reintegration is the term of art in Afghanistan. It was reconciliation in Iraq. That means, that particular term means the very high level discussions with Taliban leadership in, in uh, Afghanistan. There may come a time when that will be productive. Uh, in the near term, it is more likely that reintegration, the, the lower and mid-level Taliban uh, reconciliation is, is more uh, effective. And then the tactical directive uh, to try to reduce the loss of innocent civilian life. You cannot achieve your strategic goals, your strategic objectives, if tactical activities result in the loss of innocent civilian life. It, it, is a, it undermines all that you're trying to do. And then uh, to get the resources to enable you to, to carry out these concepts, these big ideas under the leadership of these folks leading these structures. And of course, very substantial uh, increase in the course of uh, 2009 from decisions that were residual from President Bush, then President Obama, some within Central Command and the Secretary of Defense's authorities, additional 38,000 troopers from the United States, some additional NATO troopers. Now that the, the uh, policy announced by President Obama at West Point in early December, 30,000 additional U.S. forces, or more non, or, uh, NATO, non-U.S. forces uh, going, tripled the number of civilians, uh, additional funding uh, to enable the Afghan National Security Force uh, growth as well. So that's what we've tried to do over the course of the last year. We, we generally are, are at the point where the inputs are reasonably right, certainly the deployment of the additional forces is still ongoing. We're almost at 14,000 of the 30,000 uh, being deployed. The commitment that, that I made to the President was to have them all on the ground by the end of August with the exception of one unit that's not required by then. And we are on track to do that, despite, by the way, having to divert some of the flow because of what's happened in Kyrgyzstan in the recent week. Now you're just seeing the first of the output. Uh, the Central Helmand operation was the initial operation of an 18-month campaign plan. That was the Marja Nadi Ali uh, clearing of that generally complete, although again the enemy will fight back. There will be very tough challenges there. Getting the kind of inclusive governance is crucially important. And I think it's been, been uh, very significant what President Karzai has done when he went, for example, to Kandahar and conducted a Shura Council of some 1,500 Afghan leaders and this was not a Shura Council that was picked by him or by his relatives. This was a Shura Council that included, as you saw, presumably on television, uh, individuals willing to stand up and to criticize the activities of the Afghan government and even in some cases of President Karzai. And he said personally, the finger should now be pointed at me. Inclusivity and transparency uh, are the key qualities uh, to what uh, needs to take place, and we discussed that with President Karzai yesterday, and he absolutely uh, agreed with that. Most recently, he was up in Kunduz uh, on Sunday, 
uh, with General McChrystal and Ambassador Sedwell, uh, and there are a number of others of these. The peace jurga that is conducted, uh, very, very important to the way ahead for reintegration and reconciliation because it will, uh, touch wood, produce the kind of national consensus that is essential to empowering the Afghan government uh, indeed to carry out meaningful reintegration of lower and mid-level uh, Taliban leaders over time. So, I mean, that will give you some sense of that and uh, of, of what it is that we're trying to do and how we're trying to proceed. Why Thanks. Do I don't know that we allow follow-ups here, do we? Well, I mean, I, this is not the White House well, anymore, Sam, Sam. I'm sorry. You got you to let Sam follow up. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> never hear we're, the end of it. You give him one follow-up? One follow-up. Why did why did Sam? Well, again, um, look. Well, what I mean, do you think that, do you think that they do politics in Kabul, uh, Sam? Wait, this can't become a, this conversation here. Get that microphone out of his hand. Um, I mean, this can't be. Uh, again, I mean, surprise, surprise. They actually do politics in Kabul. I mean, uh, or that people occasionally uh, will nod in the direction of domestic politics. Um, I mentioned to somebody, you know, when I did my recent Senate Armed Services Committee hearings and other committee hearings that, you know, I, gosh, they still do politics on Capitol Hill, even though, you know, there's been an election and so forth. I, I know, I, I, it, I think it's true. Uh, would you agree, Congresswoman Harmon? <laughs> okay, let it be noted she nodded her head. But yeah, there's certainly, and, but look, there's also something here about sovereignty. Uh, there is something about an individual who has been elected, you can say what you want about the elections, but he was elected. The Afghan people recognize him as their leader. Uh, he is the commander in chief, uh, and we need to keep that in mind as well as we move forward and, and, and endeavor to make this a partnership uh, against extremism uh, and against uh, illegal narcotics uh, industry bosses and all the other challenges that Afghanistan has. This has to be a cooperative endeavor. And that's indeed what, what uh, we're, we're striving to make it. Sam, what's your, <coughs> your name and affiliation? Timothy Towell, a former private in the U.S. Army Reserve, <laughs> never made PFC general. <laughs> um, <laughs> we could fix that probably. <laughs> <coughs> I'm an Irish American and I like Brits, but I like them when they're playing polo and drinking single malt whiskey and not in Ireland. What is your policy thinking, forward-looking thinking about people who generally don't like outsiders in their homes, in their villages, in their valleys, in their mountains, in their provinces? What is your view on that? Well, my view is that if you stay too long, you come to be seen as occupiers without question. Uh, I mean, I was asked that repeatedly when I w was preparing to go back over to take command in Iraq. The truth is, though, that uh, I used to use the phrase that when you conduct an endeavor like Iraq or Afghanistan, when you launch an operation like that, you have to recognize that there's a half-life. And there's a half-life of how long it is that they really are happy to see you. And uh, they were happy to see us in Iraq. Again, I, again, uh, and it didn't matter. Shia, Sunni, Kurds were all delighted to have us there. No one loved Saddam, uh, and seeing him gone was great. Um, but then what you do, how you act, how you carry out your mission has a great deal to do with how long that half-life lasts. And there will be, by the way, individual half-lives, different half-lives in different parts of the country, depending on how the individual units and leaders and all the rest of that uh, uh, carry out their tasks. You can actually put time back on the half-life. I would argue that that, that, that half-life had run out in certain areas of the country, long since actually when we launched the surge, and that we were able to actually uh, get back to the point where the Iraqis were happy to have us because we now helped them get rid of Al-Qaeda, uh, whom they'd begun to associate with three real millstones that we also tried to help hang around al-Qaeda in Iraq's neck. And that, that was indiscriminate violence, of which al-Qaeda was guilty repeatedly. Uh, oppressive practices, uh, you know, the social activities they carried out were, were horrific. Uh, and then also uh, extremist ideology, which again the Iraqis did not embrace uh, once they saw it laid out uh, plain and simple. But again, it's always, what have you done for me lately? 
Uh, and again, this is not unlike politics, I think. Again, you have a constituency if you are a commander of a foreign force in a country, uh, and you have to be seen to be serving the people and helping your host nation counterparts to do the same. Uh, there are often inflated expectations. I remember the question constantly in Iraq used to be, you know, General, you could put a man on the moon. Uh, why can't you just turn on the electricity in Mosul? Uh, and, you know, they never quite understood why we had this great technological capability but couldn't do something as seemingly simple as that to them. Um, so, I mean, what's the situation in Afghanistan? What you're really getting at, because you're talking about valleys, <laughs> which we didn't have in Iraq. Um, but uh, clearly, again, it depends what we do, how we do it, and whether they see this, whether the people see this <coughs> as offering a brighter future for them and for their families uh, or not. And uh, if we can convince them of that, then they will tolerate. By the way, they will never truly applaud. No one, no country, I don't think, ever truly welcomes foreign forces on their soil Although, again, over time, there are factors that can mitigate that. The strategic agreement reached with Iraq was of enormous importance because it recognized their sovereignty. And then, by the way, we have carried out every step of that, including, as I mentioned earlier, withdrawing our forces uh, from their cities, uh, going to where they're in the lead rather than us in the lead, arrest warrant-driven operations rather than intelligence-driven operations, and on and on. Uh, and and, of course, drawing down in accordance with what we said we would, all of which has been hugely important. It's undercut that argument that, that al-Qaeda in Iraq used to use, that the Americans are here, you know, they want to occupy us, they want to steal our oil. I pointed out to a, to a couple of Iraqi leaders at various times that for the price of one year of our operations in Iraq, we could have bought all of Iraq's oil for the next 10 years, uh, and we wouldn't have had to uh, go in there and, and do what we did. So, uh, again, I think... We're sensitive to that. We're working very hard to try to operationalize that concept. That's one of the big ideas, if you will, that, again, General McChrystal has very forcefully brought in. Uh, but it, it's tough to do in a, in a very challenging and volatile and, uh, and, and violent uh, endeavor as well. There's General, one of the hallmarks of your successful counterinsurgency campaign in Iraq was information operations, and you're yep. very keen on being first with the truth and getting into the media. Yes. Yep. Could you assess how successful we and our allies have been in both Afghanistan and Pakistan in this critical area? Well, in Afghanistan, can you go back to the puzzle slide? Because I think I should point out what we did not have at all was an information operations task force. Um, and again, um, we had a tremendous uh, admiral leading the effort in Iraq, um, uh, Rear Admiral Smith, Greg Smith, uh, and his reward was first he got to come to CENTCOM when I left Iraq, and so we all migrated down to CENTCOM, and then as the focus increased on Afghanistan, needless to say, he has now helped establish the Information Operations Task Force in Kabul. Uh, and, and we've finally got a structure now, in fact, one of the biggest areas of improvement that both Ambassador uh, Holbrook and I uh, uh, agreed on was, in fact, the development of the communications. It's really strategic communications, what have you. Certainly, the, the, the admonition that guides you is being first with the truth. You're trying to beat the bad guys to the headline, but you've got to do it with, with, with the facts as you know them, uh, because Sam Donaldson will be all over you if you <laughs> put lipstick on a pig or in any way <laughs> Um, uh, try to be expedient with that. And uh, in Afghanistan, we finally, I think, have uh, a good uh, apparatus, but of course you also have to have actions on the ground. And again, if you have a case in which innocent civilians uh, are killed in the course of an operation, uh, that can uh, obviously undermine not just your communication strategy, but it will also undermine your overall uh, effort to achieve your strategic uh, goals and objectives. Um, Pakistan is, a, is another matter entirely. Uh, you have, uh, you know, narratives there. Again, domestic politics very much influences what is said in many cases. Surprise, surprise. Um, you have a press that is, uh, again, quite, quite interesting in, in how it operates. Uh, and, you know, you have this... It's very puzzling to us, but you really have to, as you well know, I mean, I'm telling uh, you that you really have to understand the local context and so forth because you have a situation in which Congress 
uh, approves in a, a substantial amount of money, the Kerry Luger Berman bill, 7.5 billion over the course of five years, I think it is. Um, and then, well, Congress did have this language in there that, you know, some folks over there took the wrong way. Uh, it was meant to be helpful, I'm sure. Uh, but, I mean, it, it, it almost got to the point where I think some folks went over there and said, hey, if you don't want the money, we can, you know, give it somewhere else. It, I mean, it was intended to be a very, very important contribution to this effort. But that's the kind of dynamic within which you're, you're operating. And again, I think there the key is with Pakistan being seen to make a sustained, substantial commitment. Because this, we have a history here. We have several times left Pakistan, uh, most significantly, of course, in the wake of Charlie Wilson's war, uh, you know, right after the Mujahideen, wh who we stood up, and some of whom were now fighting, of course, uh, uh, took down the Soviets and forced their withdrawal. Uh, we were out of there and basically left Pakistan uh, holding the bag and, and trying to figure out how they were going to move on from there. Uh, there's a memory of that. There's a memory of the period uh, uh, of the Pressler Amendment where no Pakistanis came to U.S. Uh, what's called international military education and training. I mean, the fact that you have a generation that doesn't have graduates from Fort Leavenworth and the National War College, it, 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 it's a, changes the context within which you're operating. We're trying to make up for that. But over time, uh, this is really going to be judged, as always, on our actions. And are we going to be uh, a true partner? Uh, who is truly <laughs> committed to helping them with the enormous challenges that they have, um, or are we going to do what we did in the past? And obviously what we're trying to do is, is to demonstrate that we are uh, very much supportive of what they're trying to do. And by the way, what they have done over the course of the last 10 months, as you well know, again, is very, very significant. Wait, how about the, f the slide that shows the map of the federally administered tribal areas? You know, what's taken place in Pakistan is of enormous importance. You recall about a year ago, up in the uh, northwest frontier province in Swat Valley, you can just barely see the river right here, this very picturesque river surrounded by peaks of, you know, well over 10,000 feet. I was just there, by the way, a month and a half or two months ago in both lower and upper Swat. In the greater Malakan division, uh, the Pakistani Taliban, the TTP, Tariki Taliban Pakistani, basically took the place over. They did play on grievances, the lack of speedy justice and inequities in wealth distribution and so forth. Uh, but they were, and they began immediately carrying out extremist activities, oppressive practices, and, and demonstrated uh, their uh, extremist ideology. Uh, so the people, people got understandably and rightly very worried about that. They were literally all the way down to here. Uh, Islamabad is only 60 miles away or so. Uh, and in the meantime, of course, there were various extremist groups operating in the federally administered uh, tribal areas. Uh, the people recognized that threat as being the most pressing threat to their country's very existence, their writ of governance, as they, as they put it. And that, together with the political leadership's recognition, including the major opposition figures and the clerics' support, uh, enabled the, gave the support for the Pakistani Army and Frontier Corps to conduct very impressive counterinsurgency operations in this extraordinary terrain here uh, to clear the area of the Pakistani Taliban and all their infrastructure. They had enormous bases up in these mountains right up in here, for example, uh, and then to hold it, and they have held it. They have conducted, again, impressive counterinsurgency operations. Meanwhile, they also uh, went into Baijur. There's been operations in Momon. They're down in Oryxai right now conducting very good operations. Some of the extremists going up into a valley in Khyber. Uh, they've conducted very good operations in eastern South Waziristan against the former uh, Baitullah Massoud's organization, which was responsible for the assassination of Benazir Bhutto, blowing up uh, thousands of uh, innocent Pakistani civilians and members of their security forces and so on. And they have, by the way, conducted operations in North Waziristan, even though the Army spokesman famously said on the day that Secretary Gates was on short final to land at a, in the airfield in, uh, outside Islamabad that they would not ever do that. Uh, they have, in fact, uh, and those have continued. But they're not going to do a steamroller type operation. They, uh, they, have, they will be selective in those. This is very impressive work. You can say, well, but they've only gone after the Pakistani Taliban, the TNSM, and the other affiliated movements. Well, true, but those movements all uh, have symbiotic relationships 
with Al Qaeda and the other extremist elements that cause our forces in eastern Afghanistan enormous problems. And the fact is they have continued to go after those. They've taken significant losses in the course of this campaign. The enemy does fight back uh, and typically targets uh, soft targets, civilians. They went after our consulate the other day. Uh, but they have done this. And, uh, and I think, again, it is very impressive. And they are continuing it. And they are staying resolute in their operations. Uh, and again, this is something I believe they deserve our support. We had very good strategic dialogue discussions with the Foreign Minister, Defense Minister, General Kiani, the Army Chief, about uh, two or three weeks ago, including hosted him down in uh, Tampa, the uh, Army Chief. Uh, and we've got to continue to build this, this partnership over the future. I, I hope that aligns with your thinking on this, too, as a, about the most informed observer in Washington on it. Thanks. Let me call on Congresswoman Jane Harmon. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for including me. And uh, I want to thank the Wilson Center for honoring my husband, Sidney, and me a few years ago and uh, tell Lee Hamilton that we miss him in Congress. I know he's happier <laughs> here, but I would be happier if he were still in Congress. Yeah, yeah. Um, General, I outsourced my Afghanistan question to Sam Donaldson. Uh, so <laughs> let me ask about something else. Uh, your area uh, includes 20 countries, uh, as you have pointed out. Uh, one of them is Afghanistan, another one is Pakistan. We really haven't discussed the broader um, geography, but this is what I want to ask. It, your, your puzzle piece chart on Afghanistan, which I have on my desk, is very impressive, and it shows how you have integrated operations in Afghanistan. But obviously, the puzzle piece chart for your command uh, has got to be a lot bigger. Right. And, and my question is this. The countries that most directly threaten U.S. security interests right now, I would argue, are Pakistan, which you just addressed, Yemen, uh, where um, uh, al Laki and others mm -hmm. have directly tried to incite violence against America in America, uh, against Americans in America, possibly Somalia and, and a couple of other countries uh, in the north and east of, of uh, Africa. And, and are there enough brain cells and is there enough are there enough resources against those, those problems as compared with Afghanistan? In Afghanistan, we are spending over $100 billion a right. year. We will have 100,000 troops soon, uh, 20,000 more kids going into harm's way, I understand, very well uh, led and hopefully very well protected. But nonetheless, we don't have financial commitments, anything like that in other countries. We're not welcome in terms of boots on the ground in many of those countries. But have we got our thinking right? Uh, will we look back in five years and say, oops, we focused on Afghanistan and we failed to pay enough attention to these other places, as was said when we focused a lot on Iraq and uh, in past years failed to pay enough attention to Afghanistan? Well, I mean, first of all, if you're asking uh, a general officer whether he has enough funding, resources, authorities, <laughs> and allies, I mean, the answer should be fairly clear. We'll always take more of what you provide us, um, and we'll try to put it to good good use for the U.S. government. Uh, actually, uh, the real question, I think, is about, and rightly, about sort of the balance of resources and all the rest of that. And can you, again, keep other plates spinning while you're really focused on one or two uh, or three of those plates? And with respect, you didn't mention Iran, uh, which is yet another. I mean, that would, I, people ask me constantly, you know, what keeps you awake at night? And, uh, you know, when you get in at 3 o'clock in the morning from Afghanistan, not much. But on other nights, um, when you've had a chance to do what we call fighter management, then um, it, it, it often can be Iran as much as it can be uh, some of these other challenges that we have. It does actually depend on the day. We have tried to take a comprehensive approach. Uh, in fact, the biggest of the big ideas that came out of the strategic assessment that we conducted when I took command of Central Command, we brought in literally 250 or so uh, civilian as well as military uh, analysts and experts and practitioners to help us with this for all the different areas, and subregions and, and sub and functional tasks. The biggest of the big ideas is that to counter terrorism. Uh, you have to use more than counter-terrorist forces. Uh, and in fact, that the more appropriate intellectual approach is that of a comprehensive 
whole of government's counterinsurgency campaign, because that tends to get you thinking very uh, comprehensively, again, civil military, but governments with an S on the end. And so that, for example, I mean, you are right that we had not focused enough on Yemen until very recently. To be candid, I felt that way when I was still in Iraq. When I was the commander in Iraq and we were looking at al-Qaeda, in fact, why don't we, sh let's, I, let me just show you the al-Qaeda network as an example, uh, if you can show the star slide um, uh, to show that particular network. This is how we see uh, al-Qaeda. Uh, and again, it is a network, and for what it's worth, it takes a network to uh, confront a network, to deal with a network. But let's start right here. This is al-Qaeda senior leadership. That's the acronym right here. That's in the federally administered uh, tribal areas of uh, western Pakistan, the mountainous areas between Pakistan and uh, Afghanistan. And you can see there's that network that's very worrisome that you talked about, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which has been franchised this year, the past year, uh, to be AQAP by Al-Qaeda senior leadership in Yemen. Uh, and you can, rightly, there's Somalia, big concerns there. Uh, uh, you have all the way over Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb. Obviously, there are Al-Qaeda elements in Europe. Uh, certainly, there's still Al-Qaeda in Iraq. It's much diminished. There's still Al-Qaeda in Saudi Arabia, very much diminished because they've conducted a very uh, impressive campaign. There's Al-Qaeda out in the Far East uh, and Al-Qaeda uh, in the United States. Um, and again, this is the network, uh, if you will. And when I was sitting in Iraq, we tracked this network because the way you have to contend with more extremists inside one area is they come from somewhere else. And we were watching very carefully the ability uh, of uh, al-Qaeda to move extremists through Damascus uh, and into uh, Iraq across the porous western border. That's been dramatically reduced, by the way. It used to be about 110, 120 a month, down to well under 10 uh, per month now. But uh, we saw the, s the, the roots going down in Yemen. That was the place. Saudi Arabia, very good pressure on them after being really challenged four or five years ago. Uh, the Gulf states, by and large, uh, uh, doing uh, well against that. Uh, but we were watching this very carefully. And when I took command of CENTCOM, among a couple of areas that I said I thought we were not devoting enough attention to uh, was uh, Yemen right there. We had enough attention on Iraq. We were going to devote more attention to Afghanistan and Pakistan. We needed to do more in Lebanon, by the way. We have tried to, to do, do some more there. Uh, and the election there was modestly uh, encouraging uh, last year. So we have devoted more. In fact, April of 2009, we had a, an action plan. We uh, coordinated it with the State Department, the embassy there, obviously, with our intelligence partners, the joint staff in the Pentagon, uh, OSD. Uh, and then after a visit with President Saleh last July, where we finally, uh, we had a very constructive meeting that was somewhat different from the first meeting that we had back in December 2008. And from that point, we started working. That culminated in a, a, a number of different operations against al-Qaeda that you may recall somewhere around the 15th of December and then 24th of December and some others uh, that resulted in the uh, destruction of two training camps, uh, the killing of uh, several senior leaders, uh, and, and in fact interdicted uh, four suicide bombers with their vests on that were on their way into Sana'a that really kicked all this off. That was the proximate threat that the Yemenis recognized. Three of those were killed. One was captured by Yemeni Special Operations Forces. That unfortunately, uh, the would-be Detroit bomber, uh, Abdul Muttalib, had already left Yemen uh, after spending a couple of months there. He did meet with Anwar al -Laki. We're pretty certain that's where he was trained on the use of the explosive device that was fitted to him. Went to a country in Africa, another country, the UK, and then got on the flight to Detroit. But so, I mean, you are right. That's the example of a country where um, you have to keep pressure everywhere. And you do have to be, again, a very much a multitasker, a multi-ball juggler uh, to keep all the different plates spinning. I think the one probably that we're spending a great deal of time, quietly, I think, uh, to uh, uh, support our partners in the region to do uh, prudent defensive preparations, prudent planning, and so forth, of course, it also has to do, uh, needless to say, with Iran. The past year, the diplomatic track has been pursued. The open hand was extended. It was not taken. Iran was given every opportunity uh, 
directly, bilaterally, uh, through the IAEA, uh, through other multilateral organizations, uh, to resolve uh, the differences, the disputes, the enormous concerns of the international community about their uh, nuclear programs. Uh, they did not take advantage of that opportunity. They rebuffed the, the world. Uh, and that has now led to the transition uh, of the, the world's leaders to the pressure track. Uh, and in fact, uh, you saw some stories today, of course, about some of the discussions on the margins of the summit today, which is very significant, by the way. Because if you think about the nuclear threats, um, I don't think the big concern now is the strategic exchanges on which we used to focus in the days of the Cold War. Now it is much more uh, the possibility of a, quote, loose nuke or a nuclear material uh, somehow making its way to extremists who might be willing to use it. And that is obviously the focus of the summit today, and it is a very important uh, subject indeed. So uh, again, I, I think we have a reasonably balanced approach. We are trying wherever possible to work with partners rather than to do it ourselves. Most of the countries, needless to say, prefer it that way. Uh, we've worked hard to quietly uh, engage other countries to assist uh, the states that are under real uh, challenge, such as in the case uh, of Yemen, where President Saleh is indeed and has indeed been going after al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula with his forces. Um, but I mean, that's something that we're trying, you know, you, you can't get stuck in the mode of your nose against the glass focused on one country or one area, sub-region, uh, and lose sight of the broader regional picture. Uh, General, let me suggest taking two, two or three questions okay. and then uh, coming to a close. There, from the press back there, was, yes, all the way in the back. And then... Uh, I'm sorry, I think the mic is back there. Why don't we let, ask him and then we'll give it to you if yeah. we could. Hey, my Thank name is Amin Mahmoud. I'm with the Alliance of Egyptian American. You mentioned uh, moderate state mean, like Egypt probably include that. Aki. And uh, in, my, in my opinion, they are a dictator's uh, countries and supporting dictators plus supporting Israel continue the same policy of 60 years supporting only government and you, you increase extremists in this country. And the Egypt might surprise you in the next two years. We don't know what will happen in Egypt. Uh, I wish you uh, uh, have I'm that in I'm consideration. I, first of all, I, I'm not sure I completely understand it, but if you're asking about uh, our policy uh, toward the political process in Egypt or something like that, I will defer that to, the, to our policy makers and of try course, to stay in the military lane but if you, I could. You're interested in reducing extremists and sub, uh, supporting dictators and support Israel policy in the area uh, will increase that. Well, if there's that's a question, related to you, uh, I believe. Please, well, I think that's... <coughs> there's a lady who was about, about ready to ask a question, then Sandra, will you all have your concluding question? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chendro and Ambassador. Thank you very much for this presentation. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm the president of Hope for Tomorrow. We focus on violence against women in, in conflict. Uh, my question is, how are you working with the African governments, the presidents and the civil society, the communities to fight uh, uh, terrorism, al-Qaeda, and uh, extremists, because Africa, as I, I know, is not a very rich country, but uh, looking at it, there are people coming out of some countries, going to Africa to get and recruit young people to become Al-Qaeda, like the one who almost, the one from Nigeria. So there should be a way, because, you know, we don't want extremists, terrorists in uh, Africa, like the Kenya bombing in Nairobi, and the Tanzania, if the USA had looked on that, that's how the terrorists started. So they should look into it, not just uh, assume maybe there's nothing that uh, may happen. May they are going there, maybe they may come again. So look into that so much as the senator said, 
looking into that funding, training the communities, trying to work with the civil society and the African leaders to fight uh, terrorism. I think uh, uh, we can work with, the, with you on that, uh, not only you struggling on this, because they are all over, they are everywhere. Somebody's funding them, somebody's giving them money. So look into that and uh, Thank we you. hope. And Senator, ask your last question and then uh, we'll wind up. Uh, General, thank you for um, your leadership, especially for protecting us. And I know that your sleepless nights are so that we can be protected. And you mentioned the Iranian. <laughs> thank, you. thank you for your sleepless nights. You mentioned Iran, and I think you meant the nuclear program. But how can you comment on how Iran projects its power sure into can. the other areas of your AOR, yeah. and what steps you're taking to counter that, please? Yeah, I actually, I, I to be frank, I really think of it in a much broader way, and I'll show you that just in a moment. Uh, we'll pull up in a second the Iran slide that, that shows what they're doing, but not just, let me answer just the first question. With respect, uh, when you ask what's CENTCOM doing about uh, to help African governments, in truth, we're not, because African Command was created uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, in fact, Central Command uh, handed off to African Command, the Horn of Africa at that time uh, in 1 October 2008 when the U.S. African Command was established under the leadership of uh, General Kip Ward. Uh, and what you describe, though, is precisely the approach that African Command, and really, again, the greater U.S. government is trying to take in the case of Africa. Uh, that's not a command with 215,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen on the ground the way that Central Command has. Uh, it is much more uh, a force. In fact, there is a, a diplomat as the deputy commander of African Command in recognition of the importance of the diplomatic component uh, of the overall effort that the United States takes in Africa. If you remember the slide that I just showed on the Al-Qaeda network, though, you saw that we clearly recognize the challenges particularly uh, in uh, Somalia and the Horn of Africa and the Sudan and then over uh, in Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb. Uh, so just to point out to you again. And we conduct, for example, what we call global secure video teleconferences about every six weeks or so where we focus on the, the, the global networks. Uh, and typically we're looking at the Al-Qaeda networks. There are other networks though. And in fact, Iran is the other one on which we can uh, typically conduct these kinds of secure video teleconferences. And Al-Qaeda is obviously not just limited to the Central Command Area of Responsibility. It includes African Command, European Command, Pacific Command, Northern Command, among others. And so all of them are engaged in that, together with, needless to say, all of the elements of the intelligence community, uh, diplomatic community, typically a number of the different embassies uh, in the region will be on those, as well as obviously the State Department, CT uh, coordinator, the White House, Pentagon, and, and all the others. So we are very aware of the threat that you're talking about. And in fact, I think if General Ward were sitting here, uh, and I recommend that you get him uh, in here because he's a, he's a great commander, a great soldier, uh, you would hear him describe an approach uh, that is very similar to what you just suggested that we should uh, employ. With respect to Iran, Senator, and thanks for that question because again, it does help me to elaborate. I, I didn't mean to imply, in fact, that our only concern with Iran is the nuclear concern. It's not at all. This slide right here shows uh, what it is that Iran does. And if you'd go ahead and put that up. Um, here's Iran, of course. Uh, here are the Gulf states, Iraq, uh, Levant, and so forth. Uh, and by the way, here you see this is the top recruiting officer for the US Central Command. That's President Ahmadinejad. Um, <laughs> Each time he steps up to the podium, uh, when he denies the existence of the Holocaust, uh, I might add, and by the way, I'm speaking at the Holocaust uh, Remembrance Ceremony at the Capitol on uh, later this week. Um, when he announces a new centrifuge design, whatever it is, it sends ripples through the rest of uh, the region, through the Arab world in particular, and has generally prompted them uh, to uh, embrace central command uh, in ways that were not typical in recent decades, frankly. And in prudent defensive uh, measures have resulted. The uh, regional security architecture has gotten a great boost, frankly, uh, from those concerns. Uh, and there's a reason that a small country in that particular area uh, buys $18 billion worth of 
items, defense items, just from the United States, just in a single year. Uh, needless to say, we now have a major general as the attache there instead of a colonel as we had before. Um, now, here's what else Iran does, though. It provides still uh, arms, trains, funds, equips, and directs uh, proxy extremist elements in uh, southern Iraq in particular. It does extend a little bit north of Baghdad in some cases. They are much diminished since Prime Minister Maliki ordered the charge of the night's operations, that was, as it was called, to go into Basra and deal with the militia extremists there. It also resulted in a big fight in Sadr City in eastern Baghdad and elsewhere, which the Iraqi forces with substantial coalition support uh, defeated the militia at that time. But there are residual elements. There's always additional training, equipping, funding, arming, and directing going on. And there's a huge effort, needless to say, to exert influence in Iraq. And it was not coincidental that Iraqi leaders were invited to uh, Tehran uh, right after the election uh, inside Iraq, something that the Iraqi people uh, very much rejected. Uh, they want a government that is devoted to their interests, their national interests, and their people uh, first and foremost, and not influenced by uh, countries outside the region. There is still, there's certainly the provision of arms trains, uh, funding training to Lebanese Hezbollah in southern Lebanon and to Hamas. Uh, in the Gaza Strip. There's been interception of various uh, weaponry and uh, other, other forms of assistance uh, trying to get uh, to both of those locations, I might add. And of course, this is uh, uh, Hamas elements and of course of considerable concern to uh, Israel has been uh, the provision of increasingly long-range uh, missiles and rockets uh, that get larger and larger in terms of their payload. Uh, also of concern, the missile program, uh, needless to say, uh, that has continued to progress. Yes, they might have uh, uh, failed uh, tests uh, periodically, in fact, more often than not, but then uh, there has been progress with that. There are a number of asymmetric threats. These are, I think, suicide speedboats or some form of, again, uh, a small craft that are going to challenge our forces uh, in, in the maritime region if, if there ever were to be conflict. And then again, you have President Ahmadinejad uh, in, I think that's the Natanz um, nuclear uh, ref uh, refining plant where they produce low enriched uranium and now uh, I think have retooled uh, to do some limited, uh, more highly enriched uranium. So all of this again adds up to considerable concern uh, for our partners uh, in the region, uh, the Arab world and uh, our partner in Israel, uh, needless to say. And uh, so it is much, much more than just the nuclear program about which there are, again, that grabs the headlines. Uh, and it is of enormous concern uh, given, again, the history of activities uh, and just the sheer rhetoric of, uh, of the leader of Iran. And I hope that then provides that a little bit more broadly to you. Thank you, General, for your enlightening remarks. And Thank you. Welcome back. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Please uh, wait until the general leaves, and uh, thank you all for coming. Thanks. Steve.